Guys, welcome back to the channel. Today, I have got a very exciting video uh, for you all. One that I can't really understand or really how I've managed to pull this off, I'm not sure. But uh, I've got a guy today that I'm going to be interviewing. His name is Will Mitchells, and he founded a company called Startup Bros. Uh, now, when I first started learning about selling on Amazon about five years ago, Will's blog was one of the first I, I ever sort of read, and it really helped me out at the time. Uh, Will's agreed to come on. He's a serial entrepreneur, so I'm, I'm thinking today he's going to be able to bring a lot of value to you guys. So, Will, how are you? I'm good, my friend. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a lot to live up to, but uh, we'll, yeah. we'll make the most valuable session we can for these guys. <laughs> Definitely. Sorry. Yeah, I built you up quite a bit there. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's amazing. Really, five years ago, when I first read the, the blog post that you put out about importing things from China and selling on Amazon, uh, to now, all these years later, have you up on the channel. It's, uh, yeah, pretty amazing. So uh, thanks again for coming on. Yeah, I appreciate that. And um, yeah, for everyone listening, you, you'd be amazed at how many uh, situations like this I find myself in where I'm on a flight. You know, one time I was out at a restaurant in Fort Myers and um, some guy just came up to me and was like, hey, listen, man, I'm not a client of yours. I didn't buy your program. I'm not doing the coaching, but I just read all of your free stuff. I just went through all your YouTube videos and I'm making $1.5 million a year now on Amazon. I got to quit my job and just wanted to come over and shake your hand, buy you a drink. and." Um, it's amazing. I, I say that not to continue to build up uh, Will Mitchell, but um, it, it, you know, for everyone out there that's struggling to make this happen, that's, that all they know is that they don't want to work for someone else. All they know is that they are going to be an entrepreneur. Uh, just get out there and start trying because, you, you know, even if you're just doing all the free stuff out there, action is the best, best teacher. And, um, and, you know, someone like Nick, you went out and took action and yeah, now we're hanging out, uh, on a whole different level. Right. But, um, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite things is being able to hang out with people that took this business model and used it to change their lives. Um, or any online entrepreneur, because yeah, it's very like-minded people, very empowered people, very motivating. And, um, and yeah, so, so yeah, I'm just as happy, uh, that you found us and we were able to be a small part of your journey. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, guys, Will, in case any of you don't know who he is, uh, he's founded a company that you've probably heard of. And if you haven't, I'm not sure why you haven't. Uh, it's called Startup Bros. And basically, everything started for Will importing things online. Uh, well, am I right in thinking you actually started selling counterfeit products when you were about 12 yes. years old? I haven't just got you in trouble. Uh, that, that <laughs> yeah, no. Did yeah, I'm pretty honest and transparent about it, too. It's uh, not something to be really proud of. But yeah, when I was like 12, 13 years old, you know, all I knew in business was people seem to buy these Chanel products, these Louis Vuitton products. I can get similar stuff way cheaper. So I wasn't really, you know, selling them as authentic or anything. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I was, you know, we were buying wallets at, you know, $10 a piece maximum, selling them 70, 140 bucks. And, um, and they were really nice wallets, you know, definitely weren't ripping people off. But, uh, but yeah, that's how I got my start and eventually got shut down, obviously. But that kind of led to this whole uh, revelation that, wait a second, like, why can I go out and sell Chanel and Louis Vuitton? Pro like, how am I some kid in Florida making money off of this brand? And this got me really set off on this, this branding journey and understanding how to create brands that really have a great, you know, emotional impact to the customer. Um, Cause yeah, if you can create that brand, you know, now all of a sudden people are ripping you off and you're the one that has the crazy margins and you know, customers love you. Definitely. And actually a bit of an exclusive here. I've never actually told anyone this, I don't think. Um, but you've reminded me that when I was, I think about 15 years old, I actually got my dad's eBay account suspended and he still yeah. can't, sell anything on there because I was actually selling fake uh, Louis Vuitton t-shirts um, and I'd forgotten that I'd done that but yeah I suppose it all has to start somewhere and like Will said guys uh, he mentioned about building brands we're going to cover some of these topics for you guys today and it's just going to be a low free value um, so yeah and the, and the uh, most valuable part there to I guess close that thought off is um, just getting out there and taking action you have no idea how many people have been emailing me. Some of them will surely watch this session. 
you have no idea how many people have been emailing me since 2015, 2014. And still to this day, they'll throw me an email and say, hey, you know, I've been reading your stuff since 2014. I think I'm ready to start taking action now. Uh, <laughs> so, hey, you know, is this blog post still up to date? Is this video still up to date? Uh, just getting out there and taking action makes all the difference. And um, I had this another revelation I had, you know, a few years ago when I really started thinking about the people that I knew that had the most success in this business, the, uh, the people that started at the lowest places typically had the most success. So you saw uh, people doing retail arbitrage, online arbitrage, flipping, um, counterfeits. None of these things are, you know, things that you want to build a career out of. Um, but it's how a lot of people build the skill sets. They build the confidence to know that this business model actually works and they can actually make money with this. And they build cash flow. They build up their accounts. They build up the skills needed to take this to the next level. So I, I find so often, you know, one of the most valuable quotes I can give people is um, think big, act small. Like you want to have this big motivating vision that gets you out of bed in the morning. But every single day you have to sit there and think, what's the smallest thing I can do to make this vision a reality? And, you know, the whole you can uh, move mountains with spoons. You can eat an elephant. You know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Um, that's, that's really the only way to do this. And, um, I find so many people are trying to get started. You know, they're trying to start their chapter one of their story on other people's chapter 10. And, um, it, it just can't work that way. So just get out there and get started. Like let the motivation and the inspiration fuel you and, um, and, and just let your gut kind of naturally take you in the right direction. And you're going to build great skills and you're going to build great income. Um, yeah, it's so not as complicated as it needs to be. I'm right in thinking where you almost feel like whatever small piece of action people can just get out there and take, uh, you almost encourage the mistakes to unfold and for people just to go out there and day by day do, even if you're just doing small tasks that might add towards this greater goal, you think really there's no other way to do it. You know, you can keep watching videos like this, you can keep uh, watching interviews, reading blog posts, and learning everything, but actually until each day you can measure that you're carrying out these small tasks. Is that sort of how you found it um, when yes. you were getting started? I find that the, the easiest way to procrastinate is learning. The, the main thing, the main reason why I am, you know, a, a successful young person uh, is because I got started at such a young age, you know, 12 years old. Um, and I was able to get out there and make a lot of mistakes and, and figure things out, right? Um, I think it's the only way to make it happen. And for a long time, uh, I fell into the trap of using learning as procrastination. And, you know, the courses, like I'm still, I buy more courses now than I ever have before. I buy more coaching now than I ever have before. Um, but I'm very kind of specific with how I'm using it. I'm jumping into it and getting what I need out of it and jumping back out. Um, so learning is really poison to entrepreneurs because I, I it is the it's the only form of procrastination that people can convince themselves it's somehow productive uh you need to be producing things you need to be productive to be productive means to produce things and most people just aren't doing that so i, I think every single day that you go to sleep that you haven't shipped something that you haven't pushed something um you know i i always say to myself do things customers see. It's really easy, and that, that kind of tacks on to the procrastination on learning. It's easy to procrastinate while learning, and it's also easy to work on things that don't actually matter, that customers will never see, and that will not affect their lives, you know? So we as entrepreneurs, you know, a fun exercise that I always go through, imagine that your customers are the CEO, right? Because they're really funding the business. Um, if you have customers, they are kind of in charge in a roundabout yeah, way. Yeah. So imagine they were the CEO. Imagine they were the board of directors and imagine they paid you money saying, I want to see your vision. I want to see your company and your mission go further in this world. I'm going to pay you money because that's what we do when we buy things. You know? um, so I want to pay you money for this. Where would they want to see the money invested? What do they want to see shipped tomorrow? You know, and do the things that the customers would want you to do if they were the CEO. And um, 
what you'll find is that most people spend most of their time doing things that customers don't care about, that have no actual value to the company, but we can play this game in our heads that, well, I'm learning things and one day this will be valuable and I might need to know this. And so, you know, don't create problems for yourself before you have them. Like take this business or any business one step at a time, get into the trenches. Like, you know, you need to be in the trenches doing the thing. And, um, and I think you are going to know the business better than most of the courses out there and most of the coaches out there. Definitely. So if I, I, I want to ask you something that I think everyone watching this is going to find really valuable. So a lot of the people watching this are interested in selling physical products. Most, most of the people um, are also interested in, you know, content building sort of business models and, and all that sort of thing. But just looking at physical products, if someone's watching this and they want to start, they want to source products to sell from China, uh, from wherever, if you were starting out, in that business, what would you do? What, what, what can someone do to get started? Yeah, so the business is definitely different now than it was uh, you know, back in 2015. And this is one of the interesting things is that a lot of the uh, content out there is from 2015, 2016, and the business has fundamentally changed since then. So, um, so yeah, it's a great question. Like what, what do we need to do today to get out there and start this business? Um, the the product selection is still really really important um but the way people think about product selection isn't really correct um this goes into you know what we were kind of talking about with branding um the branding the differentiation uh the uvps the usps unique value proposition unique selling proposition these things are becoming very very important on amazon and if you don't understand how to you know, how to say, for instance, if you don't understand how to convey authority on Amazon right now, it's really difficult to win because we're in a world right now where people don't really trust Amazon reviews. Uh, we're in a world where people are kind of distrustful of the whole platform. They, they know that there's tons of Me Too products out there, the same crap being sold. So people are, um, you know, the way that people shop on Amazon is changing. And because of that, the opportunity to get started is, is a little different now. So if I was getting started today, um, what are the differences between, you know, the 2015 model and today? I would spend a little bit more time. You know, there's kind of a stage now between product research and samples. Uh, and maybe not samples, but definitely, you know, between product research and an actual launch, there's kind of this new stage that I would put in that is just using PickFu. Uh, and different survey and A-B testing tools to basically fine tune your product and figure out what exactly you need to launch to win uh, on whatever you're targeting. So, you know, this is actually a derivative of how I build businesses in general. If I'm going to go out and build a new brand um, and anyone can, you know, see these methods, if you just Google uh, Startup, Bros, Startup Bros name test and uh, or Startup Bros business name and um, uh, Startup Pro's logo. I have two really good tests that kind of show how this works. But when I'm going to start a new brand, uh, the first thing I do is basically create a virtual representation of the brand and whatever you know variations of the brand. So maybe I'm testing different scents and I'm going to put different scents on the different variations. Maybe I'm testing different packaging and I'm going to put different packaging on. Maybe I'm testing different brand names, different taglines. You know. Whatever it is, I basically go through and fine tune all of the different, you know, pieces of the business with A-B testing. Um, and if it's not A-B testing, if you don't have your own audience, you can use PickFu or a survey tool to do this. And mm -hmm. what you can do is not only run tests on your variations, on your ideas to see which one's going to perform the best, but you can actually go take, say I'm trying to, you know, launch a bath bomb. I can go put bath bomb into Amazon pull the top five photos and then have my photo put that into the AB test. And I can basically not launch a product until I figure out what exactly is going to outperform all of the top ranking products for this keyword on Amazon already. So um, I got, I got a little bit deeper into that then. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I want yeah. To, but, but yeah. Um, 
like that that's one step that i'm adding into everything i do and am advising all my clients to add in is you know don't be afraid to spend 100 to 250 I'm usually spending about $1,000 on just A-B testing to just the, the traffic and running the test um, before I launch anything to figure out what should the business name be? What should the tagline be? What should the logo be? What should the color scheme be? What should the verbiage on the bottle be? You know, all of these things. Um, is this, this packaging is going to cost me a buck fifty more per unit. Is it worth it? I don't know. Let's, let's run a survey and see. So, um, this is one of the main tools I think people are missing. It's still, most people getting started in this business, it's still pretty much like open up Jungle Scout, um, open up Viral Launch, start looking at data. You know, I, I can't tell you how many emails I get a week. People are like, you know, it's got a four and a half out of five idea score. I'm like, listen, guys, I don't know what an idea score is, but it's not how I'm launching businesses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 100%. And as we're talking about, when you're actually starting at the beginning of building a brand and I found that really, really interesting. Do you think that when you're, say you're launching a fresh brand of products, how important do you think it is to find a sort of laser focus of the actual brand? Would you go as far as saying someone when they're building a brand should build out a, almost a customer avatar of their perfect customer, their ideal customer. So they know what, their ideal customer looks like, how they walk, how they talk, where they might live. Do you think that's important? And if you do, how do you ensure that your products, your branding targets that ideal customer, but doesn't shut off the brand to everybody else? Or do you think it's just a case of zeroing in on your market? Uh, right. Yeah. I just wondered what, Very, what your thoughts uh... are on that sort of angle. Yeah, very complex question. A good question. Yeah. Um, so, so I I guess the and and the question really is then um, the question really is uh, refresh simplify yes. the question for me. So, mm -hmm. do you think that when somebody's coming up with a brand name, should they focus in on? Yeah, because I realised I've just asked you about four questions rolled into <laughs> one there, but. Do you think, what, what do you think is a better approach? That's probably a better way for me to put it. Um, what do you think is a better approach? Do you think when you're coming up with an eye, an angle for a brand, uh, you know, what sort of colored packaging it has, who your sort of target customer is, what do you think is the better approach? Zero in on, on just one corner of the market or, you know, go with, almost a more open approach, like you say, right. possibly using, um, I don't know, feedback. Um, say, for example, if, if you were selling a product that you knew predominantly females were going to be buying, would you sort of not go as far as almost making, you know, very feminine colors? Uh, yeah, I, I just wondered, I suppose it's right. probably answered by yeah, you know, and it's, split testing. It's, it's, I would use a lot of split testing to figure that out. Um, mm -hmm. That is very true. Um, and, you know, this is where Amazon's getting really interesting right now. Um, Amazon is just becoming a developed and mature business model. And what comes with that is people are willing to spend more money. People are willing to, you know, uh, invest in different, different things more heavily. Um, I think there's two ways to win on Amazon. You can play the, the technical game. It's really like the left brain and the right brain way to win on Amazon, right? The left brain way to win is very analytical, very data centric, and it's very much understanding how the algorithm works and um, how to take advantage of, you know, how to get ranking on certain search terms, um, how to make sure that, you know, you have 4.5 or five stars visible and always making sure of that. So you never drop to four, you know, so, so that's one way to build this business. My suggestion to people getting started is actually to go the other direction. Um, just because like I know all of the guys who know the technical side of Amazon, it's, it's, getting, it's getting away from where anyone can compete with these guys. Uh, they have, you know, sophisticated proprietary software platforms that are doing things for them that, you know, only a hundred people have access to. So you're never, you know, Amazon's never going to figure it out. Um, 
there there's a lot of tomfoolery going on on uh on the left side the left brain side of amazon so i think the way to win now is the right brain way and this has been my opinion you know in business since i was very young because i played the analytical game the analytical left brain way of business it works but it's very short term you can't build a business out of knowing how the amazon algorithm works uh, you can start doing consulting. You can start doing, you know, these sorts of things. But uh, one day that algorithm is going to change. And, you know, what then? Uh, great example is like the Google Penguin algorithm. And, you know, all of these Google algorithm updates all throughout the years, like people come to me and they're like, you are an SEO genius. How do you do this? And I'm like, listen, here's how I do it. I don't think about SEO. <laughs> like I just try to create really, really great content for my target customer and like you said, Nick, if, if you understand who your target customer is on a deep level, you're going to be able to sell to them and develop the product better than anyone else, right? Um, you know, uh, I know I'm kind of jumping all over the place, but your, no, your no, question no, no. is all over the place too. But I, yeah. uh, I, uh, I was talking to a copywriter a few days ago who was getting into this business. And I told her, like, listen, don't be intimidated about the products because the products are just another form of copywriting like if you know how to do copywriting you already know how to win at product development too it's just a different medium to do copywriting <laughs> yeah. so um so so yeah I, I really think that the way to win in this business now is to go the right brain route which is the more brand centric it's really difficult to uh, to describe in any concrete terms, right? And this is why it's a, a right brain concept. It's very much uh, ephemeral. You know, you have to really get in touch with your target customer. And to take this to a tangible place so people aren't, you know, anytime I use the word ephemeral, to tell you the truth, I'm not even 100% sure I use that correctly. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we'll find out after the session. Someone will comment. Um, but to, uh, uh, to bring it to a more concrete place, though, and um, some, this is going to piss off someone for sure, but uh, a good example that I always use is it, politics is very divisive in this country, Nick. I don't know if you've heard. <laughs> yes, uh -huh. yes I've, I've heard. It's quite where we are as well, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. Is, yeah, yeah. you guys are heating up too. You guys followed, <laughs> followed us right along. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, so I, I always use political examples just to really exemplify yeah. um, how you can, if you understand who your target customer is and play this right brain game, you can destroy people playing the left brain game. Because if, if I'm trying to sell, let's say, a gun holster, anyone that's selling a gun holster that doesn't know anything about the target customer they're going to go pull up a bunch of keyword research data and they're going to start looking at things. And they're going to you know, find a bunch of data. Yeah. What is that data going to show them? Is that data going to show them who that person really is and what's going to really, uh, what are these, these next level marketing tactics that are going to make this person remember your brand forever and go tell their friends about it? You know, that level of brand engagement and product experience, you cannot do that through data and analytics and everything. So if I know who the target customer is for the gun holster, I'm going to know that this person is probably conservative. Right there, right? I have the ability to market to this person in a way more effective way than anyone that's playing the left brain analytics game mm -hmm. because I just know that this person's a conservative. So now in all my marketing, I can actually start pushing that, right? Now in my marketing, I can push what are, what are conservative traits? What are the values and traits that uh, the character traits that these people associate with themselves? They want to feel strong. These are people that want to feel like they're protecting their family, right? So now I know, okay, I can put uh, a, a, one of my secondary product images should, be, should really push this value proposition that if you buy this product, your family is going to be safer all the time. You're going to be a better man, a stronger man, because you have this product and protect your family. Um, what, is it worth it for me to go get a, um, some type of sponsorship from the NRA? I don't know, maybe, but I'll tell you that there's no amount of data and analytics that would ever figure that out. Um, mm -hmm. So these are obvious things when I say them out loud, right? Oh, yeah, let's put a little NRA logo in our secondary product photos and say that this is somehow endorsed by the NRA. What's that cost? $500? Okay. 
Um, mm -hmm. These sorts of things are impossible to find with data and analytics. Yeah. And this is where I think Amazon is going because the data and analytics game is pretty cornered now. Uh, yeah. The guys, I I'll tell you because I, I have worked Please. with or trained myself <laughs> like 90% of the people that do this now, um, no one understands how to build brands. They look at brands that have customer engagement, that customers actually like interacting with the products and the brand and they're dumbfounded. They have no idea how anyone could ever pull this off. So, mm -hmm. so I, I think, you know, me personally, one of the most valuable things I ever did was get out of the get rich quick analytics side and really focus more on the right brain, building a brand that people love side. Yeah. Um, and it's made a huge difference and it's made me way more money. You know, it's counterintuitive that you would make more money like that, but, uh, but yeah, I make way I mean more money. <laughs> well, how, how you've just explained that, I can't really uh, explain. It. It's almost like a weight has been lifted maybe in, in my head. And I've been trying to, you know, you try and figure these things out gradually. I think, I mean, I know some Amazon sellers that spend a lot of their time just constantly gaming the system, uh, you know, finding a way to maintain on top. And I think, well, okay, fair enough, they're doing that. But what sort of a life is that if you're just constantly fighting this ever-changing algorithm that you've got no control over? But what you've said about almost switching the focus, I, I think like almost the penny or the cent has dropped for me in a sense where I think the focus, guys, and a really powerful thing I hope you can all take away from this is instead of spending all your time trying to keep up with the next tactic, if you change your approach over to the right, right hand side of the brain thinking, I think I've got that right, then well, what are some actionable steps someone can do to maybe, do you think if someone was to, say, right, I want to build an audience of people that I can serve with products. I think that makes sense. One of the things I've had in, in my mind and possibly something I'm going to focus on next year is building up a community, like a Facebook group around a topic that potential products might serve and I can get their feedback. What sort of steps can people take to actually move focus onto this right-hand side of the brain type of thinking? Yeah. It sounds crazy, but you just go out there and start helping people. I mean, that's really the most effective way that I've found. And I know, Nick, I mean, that, that's what you're doing with, uh, with your business and yeah, yeah. startup rows. Like it, it's one of the best ways to, um, you know, if, if I'm trying to figure out something to do with startup rows, some new course to launch or something, you know, obviously I'm going to jump on a call or a webinar with, I'm going to start talking to, to the clients and the members and be like, what are you guys having trouble with? What can I help you with right now? Oh, you know? Um, so um, I think that the actionable step is, yeah, like just helping people. And this is a weird example. I haven't used mm -hmm. this example before, but uh, like last it. night, <laughs> last night before I went to bed, um, I was looking up um, sound cards and um, just kind of want better sound out of my computer. But um uh, in my looking that up, I discovered this thing called a, a DAC, which is like an external sound card um, and uh, a digital analog converter. So it takes a digital mm -hmm. signal to, to an analog. But anyways, um, and I was looking up like what are the best DACs out there? And the best one is like this $3,000 ridiculous device. And the second best one is this little $200 device. And if you look like while I was reading about it, it was just fascinating. So in like on Wikipedia and everything, this is one of the best DACs out there. Uh, some guy on a forum named like Nature's Way 4555 or something. Um, no one even knows this guy's name, but he started ranting on some forums back in like 2010. And he was like, this is ridiculous that they're charging this much money for this product. You guys are all being robbed. I understand it's a good product, but you have no idea how much they're overcharging you. This is very simple. I'm an electrical engineer. I'm a mechanical engineer. So he basically got so pissed off in these forums and, and created such a ruckus. And people were like, no, it's a great product. You couldn't build something better. So he's like, all right, I'll build something better. And uh, he just went out there and spent like a month or two just building out this product and everything. And um, eventually the guy got banned from the forums and just disappeared. So no one knows what happened in the sky. No one has any idea who created this this interface, but now there's a bunch of companies that took his designs and basically, you know, they created the product and it's a great product. So, you know, that guy obviously didn't make any money off of it, but um, but that product has probably 40% of the market share of this industry. Mm -hmm. So 
I, I mean, you, t- you tell me how to game the Amazon algorithm to get 40% market share of an entire industry. Yeah. Um, to do these sorts of things, you have to really get in touch with the target customer and really genuinely care about them and solving their problems. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is why, you know, everything, uh, any of my training you go through, I'm always talking about we're at a point now where you have to pick things you're passionate about. Either you're passionate about the product uh, or you're passionate about the person using it because you cannot take this marketing or this product development. You can't get to this next level. You know, there's, there's a level of your consciousness that's basically locked until you get aligned with something you're passionate about and care about. And once you hit that point, you can really start to leapfrog people. Most people selling on Amazon do not care about what they're selling. Most people selling on Amazon are people that got started in 2015 to 2017, and they're playing the data left brain game. Um, I I would say probably 10% of the people that I've worked with have created stable, sustainable brands that I could say confidently are going to withstand all the algorithm changes and everything. Um, and, And, you know, to your point, Nick, you see all these people that spend so much time in the tactics. It's the same thing with me doing SEO. You know, I, I don't spend any time trying to stay up on SEO concepts. I'll spend maybe like once or twice a year, I'll go jump in for a few hours and make sure I don't screw anything up. But basically, I'm just creating the best possible thing I can for a very specific person. And because I understand that person and I can teach it better than anyone else, Google's algorithm is literally using my content as a model. <laughs> so every yeah. time the algorithm changes, I just make more money and everyone else freaks out. I, I work less and make more money as the algorithm changes. And it's the same way that it works on Amazon. If you have a, you know, I always say that there's, there's a few, very few vertical items, you know, in business, there's all these chronological things that we're going to do over time. I call these our, our horizontal items, right? So we're going to do, you know, Facebook ads over time, we're going to do uh, PPC over time, we're going to do, you know, keyword research. But um, there's just very few vertical elements of your business that actually run through and penetrate and intersect every single thing that you do. So like your brand and your mission and, you know, all of those things, um, those are Those are vertical items that intersect every single thing you do. They will have an effect on every product insert, every uh, follow-up email, every listing. You know, it really matters, these intersectional items. Um, So, yeah, I I really try to focus on those and get those right. If you can create uh, that magic in your business to where we all have businesses that we, like, love the businesses. Anything they launch, like, we're on top of. You, we have to emulate that. If we can emulate that, that's where you go from just making money on this business to being able to sell these things for many, many millions of dollars. Yeah, no, that's uh, incredible, to be honest. I haven't had it explained to me uh, in that way at all before. Um, I suppose then, guys, we, we will be wrapping things up shortly because Will's a very busy man. Well, if someone wants to start understanding their brand and what they need to do to maybe improve things. Uh, I know you offer some pretty comprehensive training. Have you got any resources over on Startup Bros or uh, wh- where could someone go to, to get started uh, with understanding their brand? Yeah, for sure. Um, I do have some good resources on the Startup Bros website. Um, mm-hmm. The Startup Bro, if you just Google Startup Bros name and Startup Bros uh, logo, these are not about e-commerce, but they actually um, kind of explain the entire rundown of how I do this type of testing. And that'll make it really obvious to everyone, you know, kind of what I'm doing and, and why I'm doing it. And it shows kind of the effectiveness of it. So that's really important. The, the biggest thing, though, is, and I'm glad you re-asked this because I don't think I, I mentioned this before. I wanted to. Um, mm-hmm just get out there and start talking to customers like a lot. And like Nick said, if that means creating a Facebook group where, you know, I mean, like if, if you're at a nine to five job trying to get out of it and you're into, you know, let's take the gun holster example, you're really into uh, home defense or you're really into tactical shooting, whatever. And like, would it not be just fun to go create a Facebook group and get a bunch of 
fellow, you know, like-minded people in a group and just spread the word and train together and develop each other. And so build, build the, you know, build those types of communities and try to really get in touch with some type of customer group. Um, the more value you can drive to these people and the more expertise you show them, there's, there's going to be a point where they're just begging to buy products from you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in terms of getting in touch with a target customer group, and it doesn't have to be you going out and, and creating the group from scratch. Um, I can't tell you how many people I've seen make so much money uh, joining other people's Facebook groups and then just becoming a staple member of that community. Um, you can really go into other people's com communities and kind of own them because uh, mm -hmm. most businesses do not have time to sit in a Facebook group all day. If there's someone who comes in and starts providing tons of value to their people, they're going to be like, listen, we need to start promoting this person. We need to put them on, you know, get them on a webinar. We got to bring them in on video. So um, just get out there and start creating value and generating value and, and displaying value uh, for some group of target customers. That's going to be the best way to get in touch with this ephemeral side of the business. And we got to look that up to make sure I'm using that right. But yeah, to yeah. get in touch with this, this loosey goosey, right brain, fluffy, area of the business that is very, very difficult for people to explain. But mm -hmm. when it works, anyone can look at it and say, that's working. That's exactly what this is supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. um, so it's tough to do. Like, you know, if we want to be a brand like Deathwish Coffee, uh, Deathwish Coffee is a really good example. Like they took a segment of that target market and they have a logo, the branding, like you hear Deathwish Coffee, it immediately makes sense. And the name itself is basically marketing. It's super catchy. It's differentiated. Like yeah. we have to try to build something like that. And I know, you know when I first got started in business, the, the concept of building a brand like that was just so intimidating. Like I was thinking, man, I, I can barely figure out how to make you know a few <laughs> thousand bucks on Amazon. You want me to go yeah. build the next Apple? Um, and I know it sounds really intimidating and, and it sounds difficult, but I promise you it's actually a much easier way to do business and it's a much more sustainable, it's a much bigger way to do it. Um, like, you know, the guys at Apple are not sitting there trying to figure out, you know, what kind of lightning deals and coupon codes they're going to run for Black Friday. <laughs> they're, they're just building great products that their customers love and anything they put on Amazon is getting ranked and getting great reviews. Um, you know, instead of working so hard to get your review rate from 2% to 4%, why not just create something that really has an emotional impact and a memorable impact where people feel the emotional need to go help your company any way they can, whether that's a review, whether that's telling their friends, whether that's, you know, taking a picture for Instagram, um, mm -hmm. just engage your customers and, and have fun with your business, you know, try to um, make it a fun experience, both for you and for the customer. I mean, a lot of the people I've followed for years, and Will, you're certainly someone that's come up and up and up, and you're now right up there. Um, in my eyes, anyway, and with a lot of people, I think, in, in, my, in the Amazon space uh, that watch what, what you've done, but uh, the likes of Russell Brunson always talks about the importance of building a tribe of customers. Having, uh, I think it was Tim Ferriss, I remember reading in, uh, I think it was Tools of Titans, might have been another one uh, about having a thousand raving fans that just adore and will just you know worship the ground you walk on that's where real business is done and guys to do that you have to shift your focus it sounds like from finding the products you know the gap in the market to just a customer obsession i suppose um well i know you said uh you know, you, you've got some stuff to do. So I, I guess we better sort of finish things off. Um, but I have found that so useful. It was almost like a half an hour, 40 minutes of free training for me uh, and every everyone on the channel. So <laughs> thank you very much for your time. And guys, what I'm going to do is leave a load of useful links uh, for All Wheels stuff down in the description below. Go and subscribe to his YouTube channel. Uh, go and watch as much of that content. It's all free. Uh, I, I have and I learned a lot from doing so. Check out the blog and Will's got a load of useful quizzes that can help you probably answer a lot of the questions uh, you might be asking yourself about any area of your business. So, Will, I think 
unless you've got anything else you want to say, uh, I just wanted to say thanks again for, for coming on. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In closing words, I guess, um, just get out there and take action guys. You know, you, the more you learn, the less confident you will be to take action. Uh, there's a lot you have to learn in this business, but you just got to get out there and start selling stuff. Like start with stuff in your closet, start with stuff in your garage, move up to stuff you see in Walmart that's selling for a different price. Will you lose money on some of the stuff? Yeah, probably, but you'll learn. And, um, you know, just don't be afraid to lose money. I guess one last little thing I'll, I'll throw in yeah. here. The one thing that I learned about, you know, cause I come from the startup world more than the online business world. And one thing that never made sense to me in the startup world was startups have higher profit margins. Any startup has 30% plus profit margins, whereas any developed scaled up business usually has lower margins, much lower. So why is this? And uh, uh, for a long time, you know, a lot of people are just like, well, startups must make more money, more growth. And, you know, but that's not what it is. It's not that if you're a startup entrepreneur, you just make more money than a, uh, a corporate business person, because then everyone would just go to the startup world, right? What's actually happening here and why startups need a higher margin than anyone else is because they have to make mistakes. They have to lose money to figure out how to make the business efficient. Um, so, so yes, you need to get out there. And one of the most valuable things I think people can do, if you can hack your brain to have fun losing money, you will be super successful as an entrepreneur. Uh, most people, you know, I never had this. I was really lucky, but a lot of people like can't go throw $100 at an A-B test. They're thinking like, man, I make 600 bucks a week. I got 200 bucks left over. I'm not going to spend half of my disposable income on a test that is going to give me some data and not even make me any money. Um, the people who can who, and I don't know if it's hacking your brain or if you just figure out how to be like this, if you can have fun, like really get excited about throwing that hundred dollars into whatever risky business idea you have today, if you can have more fun with that than you would throwing a hundred dollars, you know, at the bar or going on a roller coaster or whatever, you're going to be outrageously successful in this business because it's just going to drive you and drive you and drive you. So obviously we don't want to lose money but don't be afraid to lose a little bit of money to learn this business because in my experience, you know, the most I've lost on one uh, business deal is probably like 250 grand or something. And the result is you get a great story. You get a lot of knowledge, you get a lot of insight, more gut instinct than you ever wanted. And you get a lot of great stories out of it. So um, just keep going, don't give up and um, don't be afraid to make some mistakes. That's part of the fun. That's awesome. Well, thanks again. And yeah, guys, if you've got any questions, please hop down in the comments below. Um, yeah, Will, thanks again. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for listening, guys. Thanks, Nick, for having me. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep an eye on the comments too and respond to anyone. So see you guys down Perfect. there. Lovely. Thank you. Mm -hmm.